Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the second of our interview series at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. I'm Reverend Oscar Sinclair. This is my friend Annalise Jennings. Um, Annalise is a 2016 graduate of Wesley Theological Seminary, where she received her Master's of Divinity degree. We were in any number of classes together. Uh, she is the Director of Youth Ministries at Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, where she and her husband Garth live. She received her Bachelor's of Arts degrees in Religion and History from Emory and Henry College in 2012. Emory and Henry is where she found her passion for the intersection between social justice and faith, focusing on issues of race, class, gender, and sexuality. Annalise is also a self-proclaimed nerd who loves tabletop role-playing games, comic book conventions, and cats. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> Long Hello. Time. Yes. It's been an age. Um, I want to just start out by, by asking how things are in Alexandria right now. Um, I know they're a little exciting in Lincoln, so. <laughs> um, they are, uh, a little chaotic and, um, there's not a roll of toilet paper to be found on any shelf anywhere. Um, and, uh, but generally I think everyone's doing okay. Um, a lot of the folks in this area are like really sticking to the stay-at-home order. We're not really having issues with that here. There's lots of folks that um, are working in the sciences and medical field and for the government, and they really do understand that it's necessary for us all to stay home. So they're doing it, um, and that means that uh, church and especially youth ministry are looking pretty different these days than they usually do. So, but we're good. We're we're doing it, you know, like adapting, trying to at least. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to somebody last week and, I, and we were talking about how quickly some, some stuff at our church is adapting. Um, and we hit on this thing that uh, the usual line that we've always done it this way is, is suddenly not applicable. Like nobody in the world has ever done it this way. So here we go. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so last, uh, last week I was talking to Ned White, a friend of mine from the denomination, and it, it came up in conversation with him that the group uh, putting together monthly themes in Unitarian Universalism, our equivalent of the lectionary, um, had postponed the June 2020 worship theme of play. Um, Ned thought this was a shame uh, and, and uh, thought there was a good bit to say about play in the time of coronavirus. He said that would be a good conversation for later. So you and I are both self-described nerds quite happily. Um, yes. And I think I, I, I hope we can start there. So what do you see as the role of, of play in this moment? Yeah, um, about maybe a day after we realized that, uh, that we were all going to be stuck at home for it. At first, we thought maybe two weeks right? We're like, yeah, maybe about two weeks we'll all be home, right? Um, when that was what we first thought was going to happen, um, my first thought was, this is perfect. All of my kids are going to be stuck at home, and I've been trying to convince them to play D&D &D with me for so long, and all of them, like, most of my kids are very, like, they're, they would not consider themselves nerds, right? They're kind of, like, preppy cool kids. I have a lot of, like, legitimately I have a lot of like cheerleaders football players like those are my kids right like that's the very kind of in some ways very stereotypical in some ways not obviously they're all very much individuals and don't none of them fit an archetype completely but they get close some of them right so uh Dungeons and Dragons is not a thing that most of them are interested in um but because of the generation that they're in uh their parents remember it from when they were kids so when I said, I'm going to teach the kids how to play D&D, &D, all of the parents knew what I was talking about. And some of them were like, that's nerd stuff. What are you, my kid is not going to do that. And then some of them were like, yeah, I remember I played that, you know, in my best friend's basement, like for days, like, yeah, that would be fun. You should totally teach them how to do that. Um, and they have been amazed at like, whoa, you can play online. This is such a cool program. Like when I get on Roll20 and show them where I put all my maps and stuff, they're like, this is so cool, you know. Um, so I think some of the parents were more excited than some of the kids were on the set. I was really excited because I thought, okay, I've got a captive audience. They're all going to be stuck at home for two weeks. Nothing to do. 
what can I do with them that I know how to do online already that's going to be easy for me to pick up and do. Um, I had a campaign that I wrote for some of my friends that's a really good one for introducing new players to the game, uh, and I said, well, that's perfect. So I reskinned it a little bit so that it would work for a slightly younger crowd, and then I uh, was like, we're going to do this. So um, that was a lot of fun, and uh, like, kind of gave my pastors a heads up about it. I was like, hey, I'm going to do this. Uh, some of our older members might remember that satanic panic thing that happened, so we have to like pray that I don't get any nasty emails like, how dare you teach my kid like devil worship? I'm like, okay, yeah. So I haven't gotten any of that, which is really good, but uh, I was a little worried because um, I've had some friends that are also youth pastors that introduced D&D &D to their students and did get that from some parents and some older folks in the congregation, but my congregation has been super like, yeah, that sounds fun, and they were like on board. Um, and every week I'm getting more like, hey, is it too late to add my kid into a group? I'm like, no, I can make that happen. So oh, for sure. I'm having a lot of fun. It's good. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, too, this is this is the one bit of pre-production I've ever done in one of these. So maybe it'll it'll turn out. I was I was so amazed at the announcement video that you did <laughs> for that. And and I'm I'm hoping with your permission I can just pick pull up a picture of, of what that looked like. Absolutely. Um, so, so this was it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. And I know I went through last night and tried to figure out the meaning of each thing on your desk during this. <laughs> and I got yeah. far enough to think most of these things probably are there for a reason, but, uh, I, I don't know what all of them are. Oh my gosh. Um, do you want me to, do you have a couple that you want to ask me about, or are there things that I should just tell you about? What do you, anything? Uh, what do you think? Let's see. Are, the very large sword in front. Yeah. Uh, an implicit threat to your, to the kids in your program to. <laughs> no, so they are actually, they, uh, they have seen this sword before. Um, it will be, they will, they're used to seeing it because um, every year, like my uh, one, everyone has to do this nerdy thing with me, right? Like I try not to like push my nerddom on these kids too much, but uh, there is a tradition in the Methodist, um, well, kind of Wesleyan background called a love feast. Right. And it's, uh, yeah, and it's, um, it is uh, supposed to be a, a thing. It's really like, it has a very kind of structured um, service, you know, liturgy to it. Um, that involves music and prayers and reading scripture and like kind of open space for exhortation. And the, the idea is that it's like a um, communion service that can be led by lay people. So it's not a sacrament. Um, so no one with sacramental authority has to be there to make it work. Um, and so you pass bread and something to drink and you usually have other food and it's like prayer and singing and all this stuff. So I was looking at that service because I really love it. And I wanted to figure out how I could update it um, in a way that my students might enjoy it. Uh, and then I actually ended up doing the opposite and made it a, like my thought was, okay, I've got the word feast in here. What does that make me think of? And I thought oh. maybe like, like a Renaissance fair, right? Um, like a medieval feast, right? So that's what we do. We we have a medieval feast every year uh, around Valentine's Day because it's a love feast. So we say that it is in honor of St. Valentine. Uh, we throw this love feast and I show up in a crazy costume. I invite the kids to show up in costume too. Um, and uh, we joust, we have a mock joust uh, where they have to ride hobby horses um, and have like foam like lances and have to try and like knock each other off their hobby horses and it's very fun and silly um, and I love it and my costume this year uh, I dressed up like a knight and I brought that sword with me um, it's really cool it's it was actually a birthday present from my husband uh, it is called a flamberge it is um, a German style of sword and the blade has waves in it um, the idea being that like when another sword hit it, the wave in the blade would um, create like a shock and it would make it hard for you to hold on to the sword that's opposing that one. Um, huh. So it's, uh, it's very fun. I like it. Um, so 
uh, that is one that they've seen before that that actually has come to church with me, um, which is a fun experience. Um, <laughs> so, so I put it there because I was like, some kid will remember that I brought that sword with me. Uh, <laughs> I, I would imagine. Um, so, so that sounds amazing. I, I want to come to one of these feasts. Um, yes. <laughs> so I can imagine sort of playing playing the role of uh, of a person who shall be unnamed. Um, somebody saying, "But you know, church is is a is a serious place to to talk about ser serious spiritual business." how do you do you hear that ever and and if you do sort of what what is your feeling towards it yeah that's the advantage to doing youth ministry i actually have the opposite problem where people oh, okay. tend to think that my ministry is all play and has nothing serious in it they're like ah oh, youth ministry you know whatever you guys just play games right um so i actually have to do the opposite thing but the thing that's really nice about it is that my both of my pastors have a deep uh, love and, and see a lot of value in youth ministry. Um, one of my pastors was a youth pastor before she was in ordained ministry. Um, so she understands it really well and, um, and is glad that that's not the way that I approach it as just games. Like we play a lot of games, right? But like, it's not just that. Um, and so what I think is fun is that when they uh, invite me to preach or lead in worship, there's a great expectation that I have to be someone who's a little more fun and a little more whimsy and has a little more play. Mm -hmm. So I get to do more experimental things. I get to do fun things with sermons. I get to do um, fun things with the, like, um, the way that we present scripture when I am the one preaching or the way we do like affirmations of faith or prayers. Um, I get to be a little more fun and I get to play with those things because I don't have to be so serious because I'm the youth pastor, right? Um, so it's, it's cool for me because I get to bring those things in organically um, and uh, people are expecting it. So it's not a big deal when I decide that I should start my sermon with music, right? That I should start my sermon with a song and teach everyone a song and make them sing it with me, right? Like <laughs> they weren't expecting that this morning. They did it anyway, right? And I can get away with it because I'm a youth pastor. So, um, right. so I like that. And, and I think that it is, there's so much benefit to that in our congregation, right? That um, there are a lot of folks who uh, are thankful for that ability to balance like the heavier things that we talk about with some um, element of something that's a little lighter that is, um, that is still very faithful um, but is also not so serious, right? It doesn't have to be so like buttoned up all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really nice. Um, so I always invite uh, older folks in the congregation to come and see what we're doing in youth ministry because we have a lot of fun and we get messy and we also are serious, right? And we are a part of each other's lives in really real and deep ways. And so um, I like that we have both. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you how do you do that pivot right now? I mean, when when everything feels really heavy right now. Yes. Yes. Um, how do you manage that pivot back and forth between the need to have moments of whimsy and the reality that I think everybody we serve in ministry right now is is going through enormous levels of stress. Yep. Um, for students, what I what is really important to me is whenever we meet, whether we're playing D and D or if we're having like our regular, nothing is regular now, right? But like our regular youth group meeting, um, that we start off with um, talking about their highs and lows from the week, right? And sometimes um, that's really helpful because the things that are highs, especially right now, are so um, are things that they never would have thought to mention before, right? right. Like we learned how to bake a new kind of bread is like one of the things that like one of our kids was really excited about and he actually like ran into the kitchen and came back with like a, like these like dinner rolls that he had made and they looked amazing like perfectly like browned and like buttery it was like all of us were like oh I want one you know um but just so cool right these kids were like 
are experiencing all these really cool, really fun new things. And so we ask them to tell us that side of it. We also ask them to tell us the other side of it, right? Like what's your high, what's your low? And so like we've had, you know, some really tough lows. I have a student who um, has um, an uncle with some serious mental health issues and the, the atmosphere of anxiety that is all around us is really harmful to him. Um, and she is watching her dad deal with that. And like, and that's a, that's a tough love, right? I've got kids who have grandparents that are very sick right now and are um, having to deal with a lot of healthcare like stuff and are interacting therefore with a lot of different people. And they're really worried about their grandparents staying safe and not contracting this virus on top of everything else that they've got. And so like the, the highs are different and fun um, and the lows are real and hard. Um, and we make time and intentionally talk about both. Um, and so I think that helps, right? To, to name the weird balance that we are in between I learned how to bake a new kind of bread and my youth leader is teaching me how to play D&D &D with my grandfather is dying and we probably won't get to have a funeral for him, right? Like right. it's tough, but that's what we do, right? Both of those things are in the lives of our students. And so we respond to both of them. Yeah. Yeah. So I keep thinking about D and D, right? Cause so I was a, I, I, um, I haven't played in years. Um, Come play with me. <laughs> might actually do that. I might take you. You should. On that. You totally should. <laughs> um, but all through all through high school and college, um, I was always I was always in a game that was ongoing. Um, and I think one of the things that was really valuable in that was was the ability to try on different experiences. Mm -hmm. Right? To to try on just different emotional experiences. Like what, what does it mean to be, you know, a, a total jerk? Like what does it mean <laughs> to write a lawful evil character and just yeah. play that out to the <laughs> logical conclusion? Um, or what does it mean to, to, to be in grief and act through that grief, but, but have it be a piece of paper, not, yeah. not me. Yes. Um, or fun things. I think I was a bard once, and, and in real life, you, I just don't sing well. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and, and so I, have you seen that at all with your, with your kids, sort of trying on different characters unlike who they are? In their uh, life. Yes and no. So an experience that I often see with uh, students who play for the first time is that they either go for a character that is exactly like them or they pick something that's like the most opposite of them possible, right? right. So I've got both in my like parties. I have some kids that are like that 100% made themselves um, and others that are just like you know, like that are really honestly playing characters that are the opposite of their personality. Um, I think it's also fun, like there's a definite like age difference component, right? So I've got two groups that are going right now. One of them is middle schoolers and one of them is high schoolers. And um, my, my middle schoolers, it takes them about, oh, five seconds in a game to just turn into complete murder hobos, right? So that's like, yeah. Uh, as an explanation for folks who may not know what a murder hobo is. So the, there is a, a style of playing this game, right? Where your goal is to um, like murder everyone and steal their stuff. Uh, and and uh, it does not take long for my students to devolve into that. Um, but it, and it's been funny to like convince them that there are other things to do in this game. <laughs> oh wait, you gave me a sword and there are absolutely no consequences in real life for me using it to steal things from people. Like, that's true, right? So, but then we get to have really interesting conversations about like ethics and morality and there are actual consequences in the game when that happens, right? Like, yeah. oh, you just decided that the best thing to do was kill that guy and take his stuff? Well, 
turns out he was kind of important and now he's dead. So all the whole town is after you, right? So like, there's, yeah, so that's fun. But I do think that they're also, especially with my like older students who are um, kind of past the like phase of, oh, this is cool. I can do this thing, I can do that thing, right? Like who have kind of settled a little more into characters um, who are very much like playing with this, right? Like I have a student who, um, had brain surgery over the summer um, and uh, he has some pretty big scars um, like literal physical scars and also emotional scars from that process um, and his character that he's playing is uh, an orc that he named Rodzal the unsightly right who even by orc standards was so ugly that he got kicked out of his like his plan like that was that's his backstory and I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> I know what you're doing here, right? And so like, that was like, that was interesting. And having the other players in the game start this conversation when they met him and like, they were like, wait, wait, out of character though, orcs are by nature like kind of ugly compared to everybody else, right? So maybe it's actually the opposite and like an orc, that's called unsightly is actually like really beautiful by everyone else's standards. And so like they retconned his character and have like are playing it as if he's actually very beautiful, but by orc standards, he's hideous, right? Like they did that. Um, and, I, and it's been really cool to watch them like care about him, right? And like knowing that he's struggling with like how he, it, like how his physical appearance has changed because of his surgery and uh and they have been so amazingly supportive of him and in the game they're like oh my gosh he's so beautiful right like yeah okay that's really cool um and i i love watching them do that because they're just they care so much about each other and it comes through in the way they play the game because i'm trying to imagine leading a conversation about beauty as a social construct with a group of high schoolers yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. And and not getting there, <laughs> and not getting to the point where it sounds like they got pretty quickly. Yeah, and and part of that is because it's a game, right? So they can they can play in in this space in a way that allows them to explore and do things that they might be like way too hesitant to do in real life, right? Like I don't know some like some of the kids in that group, they might actually go up to that kid and be like, you know what, you are really beautiful. But like most of them wouldn't know how to say that in real life, but they can say it to him in the game, right? Like they can say it to his character. Um, and and that means a lot. So yeah, I think it's because they have the freedom in that space in some ways. Uh, to avoid the like the awkwardness of that conversation in real life they can do it in the game as their characters and that gives them the space to um to like take care of him in a way that feels less awkward <laughs> than it would in real life right so huh that's a great story that's a yeah. great story <laughs> that's really cool uh, So, so when did you when did you discover Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop role playing? Um, in college. Uh, okay. So my uh, my husband is also a huge nerd. Um, he was playing with some of his friends, um, and uh, so at Emory and Henry, we had uh, these two intentional living houses. One was for um, men's spiritual life and one was for women's spiritual life and I lived in the women's house he lived in the men's house um they're now just one house which is cool like because the school has transitioned to like co-ed like living and so that's just one spiritual life house for all genders which I think is really neat um so that people don't have to like make that distinction if they don't want to or need to or whatever so um but so we were in these houses and uh, and we that's kind of how we became friends actually was like living so close and doing all these things together jointly with our houses. And uh, the boys were playing a lot of D&D &D and Magic the Gathering and other like similar games. Um, and I was like, what is this? And they uh, introduced me to it. And I was like, uh, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. And I haven't stopped since. Um, so through seminary, uh, especially, it was really fun. My first year in seminary before I, um, like really had felt like I had like 
gotten into the life of seminary and, and really made a lot of community with other people. Um, I was playing online with him and his friends. Uh, and right. that was a really nice way for me to stay connected to um, folks who I couldn't be physically close to anymore, uh, which is also a good reason why we play it now, right? Um, but then uh, I, like, as I started sinking into the community at Wesley, um, I found more people who were interested in either learning how to play the game or who had played it a lot and wanted to play more. So like by my last year, we were playing all the time, right? We had lots of like games going all the time that different people would be DMing for, like leaving the game for or whatever. And it was like, it was so fun. We loved it. And like anytime it was like, oh, it's Saturday. What are we doing? Playing D&D &D and ordering a pizza. Like, let's do it, right? So we'd all pile into someone's tiny apartment and, and play. And it was just, it was so fun. Um, and we had like, lots of different uh, skill sets that got brought into it, right? So like, um, my husband has an encyclopedic knowledge of this game. Um, and so when you need to build a character, you ask him how to do it, right? You're like, I have this idea, is this possible? And he's like, yes, here's a 20 step guide for how to create that character, right? Or um, we have friends that are artists and we're like, hey, this is the idea that I have for this character. They're like, I'll draw it, right? Or like, they'll make the maps for us or whatever. And it's just so cool, right? We have like our English major friends who are like, ooh, we can improve upon this story, right? And like doing all these like fun, it's just fun. Like all of these people collaborating um, and creating something from the lives that we had kind of outside of seminary, right? Like all of our non-theological skills and sometimes also our theological skills, right? Like. Uh, a, a theme that we played with a lot was um, how we could build a, a campaign around the seven deadly sins. And we had like three different iterations of how we might play that game and like which demon would represent pride and which demon would represent, right? Like how do we like, you know, um, and that was a lot of fun too. And like just trying to create like characters and play with those kind of things like worked really well in a group of like, you know, crazy theologians too so it was fun yeah i'm um regretting that i was a commuter student for a moment i know yeah, yeah. Uh, that would have been wild i'm imagining the pizza too there was <laughs> nebraska yes. is not known for its pizza oh sad <laughs> um <laughs> Sorry, to every congregate listening to this, yes, there's good pizza in Lincoln. It's not quite East Coast pizza. <laughs> I'll probably get at least two or three emails about that. <laughs> How dare you say our pizza's bad. <laughs> I know, Valentino's is great. Um, so Garth is also in youth ministry these days. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is he... <sighs> I'm trying to think how to ask this question. Is he also running games with his with his youth through this? Yep, and he actually his his students are nerds. Like his students, like found out that he played D and D, and were immediately like, "Make a campaign for us." Like we're not even getting to it right now, right? Like they like immediately wanted to play, um, and so like that he has been playing with them for months now. Um, you know back before the virus, um, <laughs> when they could play in person, right? Like he, he built like an entire world for them uh, and has been playing with them for a while. And at one point was running, I think three games, right? He had high school, middle school and parents because the parents were like, I wanna play too, right? So, yeah. um, so he, he has like joked before that his church basically has just hired him as a professional DM, right? So um, <laughs> but he's, he's having a lot of fun. So it was a good, it was easier for him, I think, to transition uh, because his students had already been playing so he could just bring all his stuff home and build their characters into an online format and then play. Um, so that was really good. Um, and I was, again, really glad that he had already charted these waters for me so that I could just follow his lead, uh, which was great. So that was really cool. He also is the one who um, very quickly was like, okay, here are all of the video games that I have that I can play cooperatively with my students online via Zoom, right? Like, here we go. And like made that list. I gave it to the youth cohort that I'm in of all the like Methodist youth pastors that are in my area. Like we all like bounce ideas off each other all the time. And we were all sitting there in our first 
you know, post quarantine, like meeting going, I don't know what to do. Right. And I was like, no, hold on, let me just start. Would you come over here and just explain all of these games? And so all of them are now doing that. Um, for if you have anyone who is trying to figure out how to entertain uh, teenagers across distance, give them the Jackbox Party Pack. It's on Steam. It's a video game. Uh, it's really fun because you uh, you need a computer and then some other device um, and um, and just internet access and you can play it. Um, it is uh, it's very fun and silly and it's like lots of little like games and it's interactive. Your phone is the controller. It's great. Um, so download that game if you're trying to entertain some teenagers it will it's well worth it's not it's not very expensive and it's well worth the cost so <laughs> go do that I, uh, um, yeah, I, I just wrote that down um yes. <laughs> I, don't know if will, I don't have any teenagers to entertain but i have me to entertain and yes, the there you go. but the two <laughs> little, little young um so i guess the one the one serious note too is just to ask i i know you know you and i have sat in plenty of services in Wesley Chapel and, and Taze services and how is it with your soul these days? Mm. Yeah, um, so I am in the uh, ordination process right now um, and um, and so everything like I have been Ooh, I have been putting off being in this process for a long time because the Methodist church process for ordination is not a joke and it is tough um, and it's soul sucking. Um, so I have uh, been, I, I have been avoiding the process for a long time, but I decided to like really push into it this year um, with the wonderful encouragement of my pastors who've said, you can do this um, and really kind of gave me some opportunities to shine so that I knew that I really could. Um, and so they like, you know, pushed me and I was getting it done. Um, and so it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. And I have been like, just going as fast as I can through this process um, before my momentum runs out, right? Um, and so everything has just come to a screeching halt, right? Because so much of it is uh, human interaction based in right. a way that's, that is not easy to do in an online format. Um, so, uh, so my, my soul is anxious, but that's not, that it always is, right? So like, in some ways, it's just more of the same. Um, and in some ways, it's very, very different, because it's a new, it's new things that are causing me anxiety. Um, so yeah, but like, for example, I had to do my psychological evaluation, which the Methodist Church, we are all very, very um, proud of because it has literally stopped like I think it was Jim Jones who tried to be a Methodist pastor um, and failed his psychological evaluation and that's why the Methodist Church did not ordain him um, so so it's there for a reason and we're all really thankful that it's there um, but like it's it's still it's a stressful process um, so I did that evaluation and it came back and they said you have anxiety I said yes I do <laughs> they're like what are you doing about that like everything I can, right? I'm like, well, there are people that I talk to and I have really good doctors who give me lots of good medication so I can get my brain to make the happy juice and it works, right? So um, it's, uh, the anxiety is real um, and it has been a, a roller coaster to adjust to things. And um, I think my, a lot of the weaknesses that come with my anxiety have definitely shown up in a big way. Um, and I have been really thankful for having a community that is very graceful with me and willing to um, let me take a little more time to adjust uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that we're like getting back on track ministry wise, which is nice. And so now that those things are settled, I feel like I've got a little bit more time to like, okay, how am I dealing with all of this that I'm feeling right now, right? Um, and right. Uh, and I'm very glad that I have a strong support network and, and a community of people who are good at uh, taking care of me so that I can take care of other people. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? How are you doing? You know, um, pretty good. Um, anxiety is a fun thing to uh, to live with. Although mine has, has often been waking up in the middle of the night worrying about some imminent 
thing that's going to happen that probably won't happen. And I was talking to my therapist the other day and, and she said, well, you know, the nice thing um, for folks in your situation with your, your um, constellation of anxiety symptoms is that you've spent the last 10 years wondering about what will happen when the worst case scenario happens. Here we are. <laughs> and, uh, and now there's some peace in that, well, it happened. So, you know, there were already 10 bandanas in our, in our, <laughs> anyway um no we're doing good it's it's um it's very strange to have closed the church um i've been saying this a lot these days but the week that we closed the church the the it was the third week of march um mm -hmm. is uh probably the hardest professional moment of of my career so far um, cause you just don't, you don't go to seminary thinking that that's the thing that you're going to do. Right. Um, but then since then there's been a lot of really exciting stuff that's happened. Like the congregations turning out in, in ways that I would never have imagined. Um, and we're trying out new, new ways of being together. I haven't, I haven't started a D&D &D campaign with my folks, but that might be a good small group ministry opportunity. Yes. <laughs> um, but like our, our, uh, our lay worship associates have, have um, temporarily redefined themselves. So they're now no longer assisting with worship. They are now running small groups that meet regularly and check in with our folks. Um, and so it's really amazing to see to see that shift happen. Um, and then personally, you know, Stacy and I are just getting by, <laughs> trying to figure out how to keep the two-year-old and the puppy alive and reasonably clean. <laughs> from that take that takes up about seventy percent of our actual time and effort, and then the rest is just trying to to get what we can done at work. Um, but it's good, you know. It's also this is an odd silver lining, but it is a true silver lining. The first two weeks of April are like two of the eight weeks of the year where Nebraska is actually beautiful. Mm. Um, you know, in, in summer, this place gets really, really hot and really humid. And in winter, it gets unbelievably cold. <laughs> <laughs> the first year I was here over the summer, it got up to 115 degrees. And then over the winter, it got to negative 20. And it just, I don't know why people live here. Um, <laughs> you live there. <laughs> I live there. Well, and, and the corn likes it here. And the corn, so yes, I live here because people have there, chosen yes. to live here. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's not a hospitable climate but but for like these couple shining weeks it's like 65 and sunny out today um and uh and that's that's joyful because we can we're spending a lot of time on our back porch and hanging out watching the dog and the the kid just wear each other enjoy out. each other exactly yeah <laughs> no. um, how is she doing how's your daughter doing she's good you know she's she's two so she has no idea what's going on right. um, other than suddenly a lot of the stuff that we had done regularly with her we're not doing anymore so we're you know she was in gymnastics lessons now we've got like <laughs> a taped out balance beam in our living room for her to <laughs> tiptoe down um so I think she's doing fine and and she she has some idea that there's some change that's happened um uh and her biggest thing is the puppy right now like we got we got the dog two weeks ago and and my daughter has very quickly shifted into eldest sibling mode <laughs> like looking at the first day we brought back the dog she just looked at it and was like okay you're new here let me tell you how it goes. <laughs> Let me show you the ropes, new kid. Yeah, yeah, that's adorable. I love it. Uh, so, so it's good. You know, we we clean up a lot of poop um, <laughs> between the potty training child and the house training dog. Um, yes. <laughs> but uh, it's good. That's good. 
Um, we're coming to the close to the end of our time, but I just wanted to say it's really it's really good to see you. It's been yeah way too long. Um, I agree. I feel like it I always good just wave to see at you, you on Facebook. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was really excited when I got your message. I was like, Oscar, yeah, <laughs> let's hang out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I don't know. We should, we should start up a D&D &D group. Uh, yes. I'm 100% not kidding about that. Yes. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. Here. Who from Wesley is still... Mm. <laughs> that would be wild. Yes. Anyway. Um, any last thoughts that you want to... Uh, to leave us with? Or... I think um, our theme for our conversation was this idea of uh, how um, play is useful in this like time that is stressful. And I think that um, taking a page out of a, a youth pastor's playbook is a good, uh, is a good thing for lots of reasons, right? Um, we have the permission to do a lot of things that uh, leading pastors are often not supposed to do because they work with adults, you know, not children. So, um, yes, adults. Um, but uh, but you know, it's okay, like to be playful um, and to find joy in little things, like getting to play games together or learning how to pick just perfect looking dinner rolls, right? Like just amazing. Um, we were all like, you're gonna show us the bread you baked. And then he showed it to us. And we're like, I'm so glad you showed us the bread you baked. That's amazing, right? And just, it's just, you know, be, allow yourself to to do that. Um, it's worth it to, to get to play um, and find joy in little things. Um, and in the togetherness that we get, even though it's weird to not be able to shake someone's hand or hug them. Um, but just being able to see a face and hear a voice and know that we're all surviving and it's okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time. I'm going to stop the recording in just a second. Um, but uh, thank you so much to Annalise Stevens Jennings um, of Aldersgate United Methodist Church um, and to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln for hosting this conversation. Um, so we'll see you on the YouTube channel soon enough. All right, stopping the recording now. <laughs>